I didn't think I'd be doing a top 5 video anytime soon, but I found trying to get the guy at the top of this list as a single video couldn't really be justified, so here we are. I realised that I also can't really justify saying that these are the top 5 most interesting, or whatever the criteria for top 5s are nowadays, assassination attempts in history, except maybe the top one. So please feel free to leave any you think should have made this list in the comments. I'd love to read the ones I haven't heard of, or even see the ones I have. So at number 5, we've got one of the most famous failed assassination attempts in history, at least in the UK anyway. It gave rise to bonfire night and about a week of anyone with a dog cursing the sky and its loud bangs, and everyone without a dog pretty much doing the same thing when trying to sleep because some kids have jumped into the field next door and are setting off illegal fireworks at 3 o'clock in the morning. It is of course the failed assassination attempt of King James I, with the attempt and the events surrounding it later being known as the gunpowder plot. James I is one of the most important monarchs to rule over the UK, as he was the first king of both England and Scotland. While England and Scotland wouldn't be officially united as the United Kingdom until the Act of Union in 1707, the ascension of James I was still incredibly important both politically and culturally. We see examples of this in some of Shakespeare's most poignant plays, like Macbeth where Macduff and Malcolm retake Scotland with an army raised in England, or King Lear where the dangers of division are warned against by showing that one could watch everyone they love die by splitting up your country, and then a bunch of other people, and then yourself. Spoilers, by the way. But come on, if you're allowed to talk about Avengers Endgame, I reckon I have a pass to talk about a play written over 400 years ago. Anyway, something that didn't happen under James I in the way of cultural advancements was the relaxation of anti-Roman Catholic laws, and perhaps understandably, Roman Catholics weren't particularly happy about that. But less understandably, a few of them decided to solve their problems by blowing up Parliament and the King, and then reformulating a Roman Catholic government in the ensuing chaos. The earliest record of an idea to kill the King to advance the Catholic cause was in 1603, when Robert Catesby wrote to another gunpowder plot conspirator that he was thinking of a way to kill the King. Come 1604, and cue the getting a gang together montage, because a team was assembled and an oath of secrecy was taken. By this time, the most famous member of the Blart Parliament and the King for Your Religion squad had joined, Guy Fawkes, although it's worth noting that he was never in charge of the operation. I won't go into detail of the plan itself, I could probably do an entire video on that, but probably the biggest issue that the plotters faced was the fact that they could be killing many innocents in the explosion, some of whom were Roman Catholics themselves, and even a couple who had close personal connections to some conspirators. The leader of the operation, Robert Catesby, saw secrecy as the biggest priority, and denied all pleas to warn some inside Parliament of what was about to happen. One such man inside Parliament was Lord Monteagle. He was brother-in-law to one of the conspirators, and while he had plotted against the government in the past, he had pledged himself to the newly crowned James I. In 1604, about ten days before the attack was supposed to take place, he received a letter, unsigned, warning him not to attend Parliament on the 5th of November. Monteagle took the letter straight to the Earl of Salisbury, and ministers decided upon searching the cellars underneath the House of Lords, but only just before the attack was supposed to take place, in order to ensure the highest chance of catching the conspirators. So on the night of November the 4th, the cellars were searched and the man at the house, Guy Fawkes, was arrested. The other conspirators were revealed later after Fawkes was tortured, and many tried to meet up in order to flee together. They travelled across the country to Wales, where they expected many to join them, and where they could launch a larger scale rebellion. Absolutely no one joined them, and most were killed in a firefight on November the 8th. Guy Fawkes was famously due to be hanged, drawn and quartered, a rather nasty form of execution where one is hanged nearly to death, and then emasculated, and then disemboweled, and then cut into four pieces. Rather luckily for Guy Fawkes, he tripped, fell, and broke his neck beforehand. As for the conspirators achieving their goals for a better life for Roman Catholics, that didn't quite go as planned, as laws against Roman Catholics were severely tightened after the gunpowder plot, and made the rift between religions all the greater. As for the longer legacy, November the 5th became Bonfire Night, or Guy Fawkes Day in the United Kingdom, where people have massive fires, blow up pretty missiles, and carry fake guys around. The word Guy itself in its modern context actually comes from Guy Fawkes, so at least he's got that going for him. Anyway, I've spent far too long on the attempted assassination of James I. On to number 4. Alexander II, Tsar of Russia, takes this spot. 
the man sometimes referred to as the Tsar Liberator, is one of the most important leaders in Russian history, and arguably set forth a motion of events that would eventually lead to the Russian Revolution in 1917. He became Tsar at not the best time. When Alexander II started his reign in 1855, a humiliating peace was the only option. Despite the fears of Europe, and especially Britain, the Russian war machine had showed itself to be woefully ineffective. An example of this is the Battle of Inkerman, part of a series of battles leading up to the Siege of Sevastopol, including the famous Battle of Balaclava, which had revealed weaknesses in the Allied army that the Russians sought to exploit. The battle saw around 68,000 Russians attack an Anglo-French army of around 13,000 and lose, so overall it was a pretty embarrassing war for the Russians. Anyway, I'm getting carried away. What you need to know is that Alexander II brought in reforms that would enable Russia to start its own industrial revolution, and finally bring it out of the feudal system that it was still running. The most famous of these reforms was the emancipation of the serfs in 1861, but another thing that was done was the relaxation of censorship laws, especially those surrounding media, through policy forms known as glasnost. Unfortunately for Alexander II, the loosening of control upon the Russian masses and the surge of ex-serfs now arriving in Russian cities led to a surge in opposition against the government and himself. In 1866, a man named Dmitry Karakazov would be responsible for showing the Tsar the danger of Glasnost. It's believed that he sent a note to the governor of St. Petersburg, detailing a manifesto for a worker and people-led revolt against the Tsar, and proclaiming his intention to kill the Tsar. Unfortunately, this note was lost in the mail and was never read. As the Tsar left the Summer Garden on the 4th of April 1866, Dmitry Karakazov raised his gun to shoot and kill Alexander II. But just before he did, his arm was knocked out of the way by a young ex-peasant called Osip Komisarov. Soviet historians would later doubt the validity of this claim, or simply claim that Komisarov knocked Karakazov's arm by accident. Karakazov's plan of running away and looking really, really suspicious unfortunately didn't work, so he was captured and brought to the Tsar, who asked him what he wanted. Karakazov, apparently panicked by the whole ordeal, replied with nothing, nothing. Karakazov was taken to the Peter and Paul fortress in St. Petersburg and hanged. The attempt seemed to have shaken Alexander II into believing that his glasnost had decreased his own safety and the safety of Tsarism in Russia, and so censorship was rapidly tightened for the rest of his reign. For example, the very university that Karakazov attended was banned from forming any kind of organisation, however innocent. The revolutionary organisation at St. Petersburg University that had inspired Karakazov had posed as a sewing group, so no chances could be taken. There would be three more failed attempts on Alexander II's life, two in 1879. One of these, the Tsar survived by running away in a zigzag pattern from someone he saw with a gun, and the other was supposed to blow up the Tsar's train, but just missed. In 1880, a member of the revolutionary group known as People's Will, who had carried out the previous attempt on Alexander's life, threw an explosive into the Winter Palace, but the royal family were not in the dining room where it was thrown at the time because the Prince of Bulgaria was late. Tsar Alexander II couldn't be lucky forever though, and in March 1881, an explosive was thrown at his carriage, which detonated, killing a Cossack and seriously injuring many, including members of the public, but did not harm those inside the bulletproof carriage, and when the Tsar got out to inspect the damage and see what happened, he was urged to get away from the scene of the attempt by his guard. He apparently didn't, or at least was not quick enough, as a second explosive was thrown at his feet, which shredded his legs, tore open his stomach, and mutilated his face. He died later at the Winter Palace. Alexander II had signed plans for new constitutional reforms that he admitted would probably be the first step towards a constitutional monarchy, but it was abandoned by the far stricter Alexander III, who had just seen his father die to a group that had flourished under his father's reforms. The course of Russian history was once again changed by the attempts on Alexander II's life. Taking the number three spot is the assassination attempt on Margaret Thatcher, known as the Brighton Hotel bombing. The event is generally known as part of The Troubles, a conflict in Ireland between Irish Unionists and Nationalists. Thatcher, and many other members of the majority party in government, the Conservative Party, were staying at the Brighton Hotel for the Conservative Party conference. Just under a month before, however, IRA member Patrick McGee placed £20 of explosives under his bath, and wrapped it in cling film so sniffer dogs would not be able to catch the scent of the bomb. The bomb was fitted with a timer made from a cassette recorder and an egg timer-like thing. On the 12th of October 1984, just before 3 o'clock in the morning, the explosive was detonated, which killed 5 people and injured 31. 
Thatcher's bedroom, however, was unaffected by the blast. Some have stated that the intention of the bomb was to collapse far more of the Grand Brighton Hotel, but firefighters said that the Victorian building was well built, and this fact had probably saved many lives when it failed to collapse. After the bombing, Thatcher insisted that the conference would go ahead as planned, and removed most of her attacks on the opposition party, the Labour Party. After the conference and bombings, Thatcher's approval rating reached nearly its highest during her time as Prime Minister. Here at number two, with a moustache, a nickname and an American presidency, is Theodore Roosevelt. Roosevelt is widely considered to be one of the five greatest presidents of America, and secured America emerging as a world power during his presidency in the early 20th century. He bolstered up America's naval power and sent the White Fleet on a tour around the world, helped broker peace between Russia and Japan to end the Russo-Japanese War with the Treaty of Portsmouth, and started work on the Panama Canal. Oh yeah, and someone carved his face into a mountain. Before he was president, he engaged in a number of professions, including setting up a brilliantly diverse volunteer army regiment to fight in the Spanish-American War. Anyway, after his presidency, he campaigned again for president in 1912 after failing to win the Republican nomination and opposing the increasing conservatism of the party. He formed his own party, championing a manifold of progressive reforms. While campaigning for the presidency under this new party, John Fleming Schrank, who had been following Roosevelt for weeks, pulled out a revolver and shot Roosevelt in the chest. Roosevelt had a folded 50-page speech and a steel glasses case in his pocket, but the bullet still reached his chest. Schrank was quickly disarmed and restrained, and probably would have been lynched by the crowd, but Roosevelt shouted over the commotion and ordered the man to be unharmed. He told the police to take Schrank to make sure no harm outside the justice of the law was done to him, and told the crowd he was fine. You know, apart from being shot. He was asked by many to go to hospital, but correctly stated that his experience in hunting and anatomy showed him that as he was not coughing up blood, the bullet had not reached his lung. He then proceeded, while blood seeped into his shirt, to give a 90-minute speech, in which he mocked the attempt on his life and then sought medical attention. Roosevelt failed to win the election, however, as the Republican vote was split between the Republican Party and his own new one, and Woodrow Wilson became president. During World War I, Roosevelt strongly opposed America's neutrality and was denied the opportunity to take volunteers to Europe. When America did join the war, Wilson, who had been criticised by Roosevelt, instead sent another general in his place. Roosevelt was not pleased and immediately published writings heavily criticising the president. And our last failed assassination attempt is the one, or perhaps I should say are the many attempts, against the life of Grigory Rasputin. Rasputin was introduced to the royal family of Tsar Nicholas II in 1905, and was summoned in 1908 to treat Nicholas's haemophiliac son using his magical and holy healing powers. He apparently succeeded, and he used his newfound influence to secure himself within the royal family, claiming that their destinies were now linked. Soon, it was believed that outside the politeness that was seen in court, Rasputin was behaving rather inappropriately. Tales of frequent trips to brothels and other similar stories began to leak out, and mounting public and political pressure forced the Tsar to have Rasputin removed from the courts. The Tsarina, however, who had grown to fear for her son's life when Rasputin wasn't there, had him return to court. In 1914, Rasputin's unpopularity led to an attempt on his life, when Chiona Guseva stabbed him in the stomach. Rasputin was seriously injured, but after surgery, managed to survive and recover, and carry on advising the Russian royal family. When World War I came around, Nicholas II made the mistake of travelling to the front lines to lead the troops himself, which left the Tsarina Alexandra, a woman very easily influenced by Rasputin, in charge of Russia. Rasputin's hold over the Tsarina and Russia as a whole was used in much anti-monarchist propaganda, and it was clear that he really, really had to go. Prince Felix Yusupov and other nobles planned to have him killed. Yusupov invited Rasputin in for tea and cakes in his basement, and then Yusupov watched eagerly, for they had been laced with cyanide and Rasputin was surely to die. Apparently not, Rasputin seemed completely fine and asked for some wine. Yusupov had also laced the wine with cyanide, but after three glasses, Rasputin still seemed unaffected. Yusupov left Rasputin in the basement as he went upstairs, unbeknown to Rasputin to speak with the other conspirators. Apparently, the simple approach was decided upon, so Yusupov went downstairs and shot Rasputin. Another conspirator went to Rasputin's apartment, dressed as Rasputin, and went inside to make it look like Rasputin had returned from the cakes and wine alive. After this, Yusupov went back down to the basement to carry Rasputin's body 
ready to be disposed of. Rasputin though wasn't dead and attacked Yusupov, who must have got the surprise of his life and only just managed to break free. Rasputin then tried to escape through the courtyard but was shot two more times by other conspirators. This time they had finally killed him and dumped his body into a river. The Tsarina was furious but only weeks later there was a revolution and the monarchy was deposed. Well that took longer than expected, sorry about that. I hope you enjoyed it anyway and feel free to subscribe to hear more from us. Again, if you think there's someone I missed from this list who should have been there, let me know in the comments. It's quite a western list with two Britons, an American and a couple of Russians. So I imagine there's loads of interesting attempts that I've missed out.